Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 132, recorded on 3 July 2013. In the show with me today, we have... James. Hello. Hi, James. <laughs> and Quentin. <laughs> Hi, Quentin. And... Annie. Hi, Annie. In the, we're going to be talking about the LTG revamp, what we did and what we still plan to do, a brief roundup of the latest tech and games news, and games, games, and a little bit of business news, and all kinds of other geekery with James and Quentin. And this is where I would put a cut in. What manner of geek are you? Uh, I am the editor of MyGaming.co.za, so come over to MyGaming and hang out with us on the forum. It's quite a fun place. Quentin, what manner of geek are you? (laughs) I'm a business technology geek, which doesn't sound as interesting as it is, but it is very interesting. And I'm also a gamer and general geek, so it's all good. Cool. Annie, (laughs) what manner of geek are you? I am the mixer. (laughs) Not (laughs) said. And that is all you need to know. (laughs) I'm a telecommunications and gadget geek. I write for my broadband at Sierra Zere and get to play with all the latest and greatest stuff and get to cover what's happening in South Africa's broadband space. Pretty cool, and we'll be getting to that a bit later. As tradition dictates, <coughs> we start every show with a random. And today's random is the Catalan number, which in combinatorial mathematics is a form of... Uh, form a sequence of natural numbers that occur in various counting problems, often involving recursively defined objects. They are named after the Belgian mathematician Eugene Charles Catalan. I hope I said his name right. Uh huh. And, and this is why SARS was down. <laughs> <laughs> M- must be. Mm. Must be. And uh, thank you, Wikipedia, for that uh, juicy piece of information. The reason this is relevant is that 132 is the sixth Catalan number, apparently. I have no idea what you just said. But yeah, I'm going to start counting in Catalan from now on. <laughs> I, thought, like I, thought, I thought Catalan was like some sort of Star Trek language going on. <laughs> That's Klingon. Well, <laughs> could, there's a game it, called Settlers of Catan. 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 Oh, it's, Catalanese. it's a bit of a stretch. Bit Isn't of a stretch. Catalan an actual language? I don't have time to Google it right now. <laughs> you know what? <it's, laughs> and anyway, sure. it's, got, it's got cat in it, so it's got to be cool. Ah, yes. Everyone loves cats. Yep, yep. With that, we're going to go into the quick geek. The rules here are simple. It's two minutes per topic. The mixer keeps us to that time limit. Do you have a timer? Or are you just going to wing it? I'll just yell at you whenever I feel like it. All right, great stuff. That's fine, too. The mixer gets to yell at us when she feels that uh, we are too boring. She may or may not, at her discretion, award points at the end of the quick geek. (laughs) The winner will get donuts thrown at them. (laughs) Can you just aim for the mouth, please? (laughs) (laughs) All right, the quick geek. Let's start with you, Annie. 18-year-old Isha Carr invents a supercapacitor technology that makes things charge faster. That's pretty cool. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> 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 All right, you come in well under the two minute. <laughs> Good job. I, I wrote about this one, and it was uh, yes, it was interesting. But I think it gets shown off quite often at these science. Well, things, so, so so what happens is my notes are on the same screen that the guys are looking at right uh, now, so yeah. I can't refer to them. Yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, basically, Shall she came notes? second at the Intel. Was it the Intel International yes. Science Fair? Yep. Uh, she is seventeen years old. Yeah, something around. And she developed 18 years, a, old, 18 yeah. years old. And she developed a supercapacitor that can, mm-hmm. if you implant it in the battery, it can recharge your device in like 30 um, seconds. And, and to say that she's second is, is technically true, but it's also unjust because she tied with a 17-year-old from Louisiana who figured out mm-hmm. new ways to measure dark matter and energy so, in space. So how did they break the tie? Did they well, go with birthdays or something? <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other thing was that the supercapacitor could, um, like we had this technology before, but she developed a new kind of molecular <laughs> structure for this thing apparently, which helps it to retain its charge for a lot longer and also charge faster and it's more stable and stuff like that. So they just need to figure out a way to cram this all into cell phones and hopefully we have phones that recharge in 30 seconds. And, yeah, what, and what's, what's nice is she looks really pleased with herself. I mean, <laughs> that, She does get a scholarship to a fancy tech university. Yeah, yeah, and that's always good. After that. <laughs> like going, uh, I, I investigated going to MIT. Yeah. You don't do that as a South African. <laughs> it's just I had dreams once as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talking about charging, uh, Annie's keeping it in the charging space, and, and I saw this as well, so I can talk about it. Um, but you're pretty stoked about Tesla, so maybe you should handle this. 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Tesla Motors and Elon Musk and everything that they're doing, and I really wish he would bring the Tesla vehicles to South Africa. <laughs> but uh, Tesla have recently unveiled two awesome things. Um, so we've, we've been on hiatus for a while, so sorry if this is old news. But uh, the first thing is um, they have put recharging stations – um, that around the country in the U.S., well, not everywhere yet, but they're going to, that allow you to recharge your vehicle in about 33 minutes or 22 minutes. It was something really, really low. Um, instead of charging for three or four hours or overnight, you can pull in, charge for 22 minutes, and you're good to go using a new supercharging technology they developed, and it's free. They don't charge you. <laughs> Oh, they charge. Built, built their own yeah. gas stations across the country. So, I mean, how does it work? Is it built into the cost of the car purchase? Or I suppose so. Something? But uh, <laughs> if you own a Tesla, you can pull into the station. Free power? Definitely not coming to South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Eskom's price? <laughs> Electricity ain't cheap. <laughs> so the next thing they did was um, recently they announced, well, they demonstrated a 90-second battery swap out. So if you can't wait 22 minutes... You just pull into the station. I believe it's a little robot that actually does the swap out for you. So they even built, designed the robot. So you pull in. Um, the robot removes the old battery, slots in a new one, and you drive off. And 90 the, seconds. And the, the, the test they did was really cool. What they did was they took an Audi, drove it down to a nearby gas station, because this is America. Gas station. Yeah. And they, they said, okay, pump this gas as fast as you can, and because you're racing against a Tesla having its battery removed. Cool. And the Tesla, they were able to change the batteries of two Teslas in the time it took to fill up one Audi. Um, Jeez, okay. I, I, and, and, That's pretty impressive. Yeah, and, and uh, look, I, I don't really keep track of how long it takes me to fill up a car, but like, I think it's pretty quick. So when somebody talks about an electric vehicle, my first complaint is it's going to take too long to charge, even 22 minutes. Yeah, it's, it's a long like, time. I can't just pull into a station quick and fill up and get going. It's 22 minutes out of your day. Um, whereas with this now, uh, you know, like the, even the five minutes at the gas station now looks long because they yeah, just yeah. don't get out, put in a new one, off you go. You'd only really fill, fill up with petrol for 22 minutes if the, 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 the pump guy really wants to wash the windows properly. <laughs> or like, if there's a queue like there was last night oh, before yeah. the petrol oh, price went up. I hope, yeah. hope everyone managed to get their, their petrol in before the 84 cents increase. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I weighed up the 25 rand I was going to save against the queue I was going to stand in and mm. the queue I was going to stand in lost. Oh, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Eventually you just get a point. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, gaming time. James, <clears throat> you're on the spot. First things first, DirectX 11.2. Okay, well, uh, obviously the new version of Microsoft's graphics API, which developers use to tell um, their games how to interface with the hardware on your system, is only going to be available on Windows 8 and uh, Xbox One. No. 8 or 8.1? Uh, I think, well, everyone's going oh, to upgrade to 8.1. Same, 8. Thing, 1. Right, same yeah. thing, really. I'm, I'm not you know, getting too finicky about calling it 8.1. But yeah, um, yeah. anyway, <clears throat> so <laughs> there's a new... Uh, version of DirectX which will uh, allow you uh, what the, and the big thing about this new version is it, it allows the system to make use of the system RAM rather than only the GPU's RAM to store textures and stuff like that so basically you know a lot of people have like a 1 gig graphics card but they'll have like 8 gigs of RAM yeah. so you can you know allocate 4 gigs of extra RAM to the graphics uh, process and it'll store all these textures or whatever it's doing mm. in the RAM that is interesting I mean the system RAM the is GPU slower when it's needed yeah Sure, I mean, GDDR3, or, sorry, DDR2 or 3 or whatever mm -hmm. is definitely slower than I'm thinking GDDR5. of, um, you, know, un, uh, you know, stuff that's been already rendered and it just needs to sit there and be called on when, you know, by the CPU or something when it uh, needs to just pop into the scene or when you want to install very large texture packs for high-res textures, you know, you're going to need some extra RAM to do that uh, before the GPU can crunch it. Uh, obviously, it means, you know, everyone gets up in arms, oh, why are they forcing us to do, uh, to upgrade to Windows 8 now? We had the same sort of argument with Windows Vista and DirectX 10, and eventually we all got over it because we, we all because moved on. Because Windows 7. Because Windows 7. <laughs> so Windows, <laughs> so Windows 9. Windows 9 coming on. Yeah, exactly. Look, we've got to wait for some DirectX 11.2 graphics cards to hit the market. We've got to wait for the Xbox One to come out before we even start seeing games that you know, feature the DirectX 11 uh, you know, features in them. So it, it's a while to go still, but uh, it's yeah, still yeah. quite interesting. Then some local news that was quite sad to hear is um, the fact that EA South Africa was closing down. 
Yeah, they didn't want to tell us what was going on. Eventually, we got it out of them. Basically, they, it sounds like they were part of the global downsizing that EA was undertaking. They, re- they released their results back in March, and things weren't looking so great. And you know, they needed to cut costs and whatever. Their CEO uh, left rather abruptly. So there's a bit of a shakeup there at EA. And obviously, they're using all sorts of fancy business terms like consolidation and restructuring and whatever. Hmm. It basically means a bunch of people around the world have lost jobs. They've closed down some studios even. And uh, it looks like EA South Africa has been part of that. Uh, EA South Africa handles sales, uh, marketing, uh, distribution. They also have a production center here to actually make EA discs in South Africa. They don't import them like with a lot of the other games. Um, so all of that remains, but they've downsized completely. There's about there's two guys left, and they closed <laughs> down the head office wow. and all that. So, yeah. so uh, uh, there's no, is there even a legal entity for EA South Africa? I think there must be. I mean, I, we don't actually ask about legal entities, but they handle all those things, support and all that. So I'm sure there must be some sort of How do you handle know, support if you only two people, though? I mean, sure. surely that now has to go overseas. It's going to be a big job. Maybe they'll outsource that sort of thing to you know an Indian call center or whatever, but <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they still need Makes a couple sense. of guys here to handle sales and marketing and that yeah. sort of thing. So that, yeah. that's what happened there. Well, um, so what does this say about the gaming market in general? We've seen a lot of companies post poor results. We've seen THQ being liquidated. Last yeah. time uh, we had you on the show, we actually ran through the people picking over its carcass. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, <laughs> cr- you know the fact that Crytek wanted this IP and didn't get that IP, mm-hmm. that we, that's what we discussed last time. <clears throat> Is gaming dying? What's going on? No, I don't think so. It's just it's a, it's a rocky patch because of the console generation uh, transition everyone's holding out on you know purchasing consoles and games um i think the global economy thing is hitting people i mean games are an expensive entertainment product so you know people just take they, they look at what they can afford and say we can't afford games mm. at the moment and, and and the market's very saturated i think you'll agree with yeah, uh, you know and, games look, that just aren't up to standard it's also like very it's expensive to make games it's, it's yeah. not a cheap thing to make make games and like the, the sort of return that that developers themselves get i mean a lot of this stuff is publishing and marketing and distributing. Um, the developers often don't see the, the return of the actual effort that they put into the thing. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's tightening, I think. It's tightening. That's why you're going to be seeing a lot of these guys getting bought up by the mm. places. Well, what's interesting to me is you see, <clears throat> on the one hand, you've got guys... Uh, you know, losing jobs. On the other hand, you've got developers taking tours to foreign countries to go and investigate. <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to get to that, aren't we, later <laughs> in the show? Okay, well, oh, if that's later in the uh, show, well, we'll, we'll it, talk it about does, it then. It does crop up in one of our uh, topics later down the line. But uh, I was going to say, the you know, there's a lot of top industry guys who've been saying, look, there's not enough room for so many AAA games. And you can see this sort of thing happening with THQ not really keeping up with the times. And, you know, they had some very old sort of, uh, well, old in comparison to what, you know, the guys who are surviving are doing, old methods of producing and getting games out there and what have you and um, you know there are really so many games out there to p- choose from you, you go and look at a store and let's not just think South Africa but globally um, you know those stores are much larger and lots of games on the shelves and you're just going to pick Call of Duty because you know everyone else is playing it and you're guaranteed a fairly decent gameplay experience <laughs> for the most part I mean <laughs> never in general right? I'm also um, shaking my head <laughs> so it's difficult yeah. what I'm saying is it's difficult to you know uh, dethrone these very large uh, games and get your other triple A thing out there um, yeah. so this is probably be part of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to move us on. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, telescope contact lens. This is interesting, James. I think you came across this. Yeah, uh, like this one we can keep short. Basically, some scientists uh, have developed a trifocal contact lens and they use. Um, uh, pl- what do you call it? Um, like Polarized? occlusion. Okay, yeah. Uh, with LCD to um, occlude whichever you know, zoom level you don't want. So you can zoom in up to a magnification of 2.8 times. This is awesome. This is like Deus Ex stuff. Augmentation, yes. here we <laughs> come. <laughs> so they, they proved it with an artificial eye and, um, and so on. And it's about a millimeter thick contact lens. Uh, they still haven't revealed how exactly you will switch the zoom level once it's you know, strapped onto a human. But... Um, Apparently they keep it a secret, blinking. but yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, back to gaming. A Witcher Three DLC is uh, free, and mm. uh, they just released a, a trailer. Yes, yes. Uh, it was nice to hear. You know, sticking with CD Projekt Red's sort of uh, you know uh, way they do things or whatever. Um, all the DLC is going to be free on PC. They want to 
uh, and of course DRM free. That's just par for the course now with uh, CD Projekt Red games. And they want to make, uh, they would love to make DLC free on the consoles, but <clears throat> they say it depends on how Microsoft and Sony are going to, you know, approach their marketplace. Normally, Microsoft especially had certain rules against giving away free content. Basically, you have to sell it for some sort of amount. Microsoft and, being, and I think, being opposed um, to something I like think that, mainly because they want their cut. From whatever it is, so <laughs> yeah, um, they take what thirty percent or whatever. Ah, geez, who knows what they? <laughs> no, no, yeah, take, I think the the Xbox, the Xbox Live, they used to take thirty percent. Thirty percent is about standard. That's yeah, what Valve yeah, yeah. on Steam. Yeah. So anyway, they, they they would make it free on console if the uh, the console guys uh, play ball. Um, so you know that's good news. And uh, you know, back to what we were saying just a moment ago, uh, the Witcher Three Wild Hunt making of. Um, video about five minutes long. It's pretty cool. There, you see the devs from Poland taking a trip to Scotland to check out the scenery, and you know that's uh, an inspiration for a lot of the locales that we're going to be seeing in The Witcher Three. Um, as you say, <laughs> it's blowing lots of development money on taking trips to foreign lands. Don't to... we have like Google Earth for this exact purpose? <laughs> Google well, Street View. You know come what? on, I, Google I, I'd Street like, View. I'd like a nice, authentic experience, and The Witcher Two was having really a really good game. It's nothing so... like having a Scotsman yell at you. Yeah, something like that <laughs> in Scotland. <laughs> What are you doing here? Um, that was a terrible Scottish action. I apologize. Um, th- this brings me to something. Uh, it's still gaming, um, but I thought it was interesting. I saw this on Twitter last night. Mm. Late last night. Um, <coughs> somebody grabbed a, a, a screenshot of a 4chan conversation. Oh, dear. Um, oh, dear. Of, uh, <laughs> of a guy who claimed that he had left his Quake 3 bot mm. match running for four years or something. Um, the AI data files had become 512 giga... No, no me- megs. Me- me- megs, yeah. yeah. It was eight gigs in total um, for, for the, the whole thing. And, uh, <laughs> and he claimed that when he entered the map uh, for the first time, the bots were just standing there. Yeah, they developed uh, world peace. Yeah, and, oh, and, gosh. and, <laughs> and, so, and then and then he went back in to test something, and he's like, it's very disconcerting. But they, they're following him, they're looking at him as you know, it's like paintings with eyes that follow you. And the second he fired a shot, they all ganked him. Chaos. Uh, well, yeah, this this peace. is this is contrasting to that game of Civ Two that went on for what eighteen years. And then ended up in like a Mexican standoff between the three nations. And, of a, and nuclear wasteland. Yeah, nuclear the wasteland. Yeah. So here we are. Which is also a very Quake. cool story. I think a key difference between those two stories is one was fake and one was real. Yeah, yeah. so the Civ one was real. Yes. Yeah. And this one ended up being a, a typical 4chan prank. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an interesting little thought experiment though. Like what would happen if you just yeah. left some AI bots? That... And, and, and we discussed this mm. in the office today because we had a commenter on my gaming um, who, who was quite abrasive about the fact about how, how impossible this is. Is. And um, while my AI training is really limited to, uh, uh, you know, third year computer engineering, um, the, I, I have actually built built a neural network, and and so what, uh, what? It's conceivable to me that you could create a metric that would actually cause this to happen, where mm. you would create a metric in the in the artificial intelligence where the guys would be able to create temporary alliances. This is a death match. This is not a mm. team game. Mm. It's a complete death match where the guys, you know, might go, okay, you know, um, to boost our KPD or to get more points, we can, you know, if we team up together, we can get points faster. Um, and, uh, you know, have a sort of, uh, as we discussed in the office, you can have a sort of thing where, um, you know, once a guy gets to a certain level, he might, you know, backstab his buddy yeah, and yeah. partner with somebody else who would be of greater benefit to him until everybody was about at the same score level. And then all of a sudden, nobody would be willing to make a move because yeah. that would, you know, upset the equilibrium. Uh, yeah, it, as you say, it, was a, it would be more of a bug than anything. It would be more anything, of a bug than uh, anything, exactly. It would still be an interesting outcome. But there, there already is a, a <coughs> computer program out there that allows you to see these things, and I've done it myself. It's called The Sims. <laughs> 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 leave, just create a house full of like eight <laughs> people. Leave the AI on and see what comes up. Trust me, it's not world peace. It's usually pregnancy and cat fights. So. <laughs> I, I think they already did that, and it was called Big Brother. Oh, of course, oh, of dear. course. But I mean, yes. nobody wants to see real people do these things, <laughs> right? <laughs> Based right. On the ratings. All right. With that, I think it's time we talk some sex, politics, and religion. First up. Um, I-10 has passed I-9 in, uh, in usage in the market share. According to net applications, oh, okay. this, is where, this is where the politics starts, um, according to net application stats. And Firefox falls back below 20%, but Chrome manages to gain against um, IE. So it looks like um, Firefox is losing ground to Chrome. Okay. Um, 
which is interesting. Mm. Now, um, w- what makes this stats comparison so interesting all the time uh, is that net applications and there's another company called StatCounter show wildly different stats. StatCounter shows Chrome well in the lead um, compared to IE, and um, uh, but they have a d- they, they they measure things differently. Net applications weights per capita internet user, mm-hmm. um, and they, I think they also look at uniques. Okay. Whereas um, StatCounter looks at page views, pure page views. So wow, the okay. fact is you could have fewer Chrome users causing more traffic. Okay. That yeah. in, that, so th- that is a, a possible explanation. The Which explanation is interesting is, in its own right yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. The other possible explanation is they just measure such wildly different demographics that they're yeah, incomparable. Yeah. I don't, uh, what what so. statistics? <laughs> getting de- getting ah! demographics? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's not even go down that the, part. The demographics wrong? <laughs> Say it ain't so. Um, what is the... I mean, it's, it's all very interesting to compare. Is it just for interest's sake? Or is there some bigger picture to who's winning the browser wars? Well, IE is still firmly in the lead according to the applications. Mm. Uh, staff count obviously disagree. Degrees. Um, but the fact is that um, the, what uh, Internet Explorer has classically had a problem where if the latest version of its browser would be adopted really, really slowly. Um, and that's why we had the IE6 problem, yes. right? Because we had up to IE8 and people were still using IE6. It was still the most popular browser the in the world. The IE6 problem. It's for developers or web developers. It's well, a big for the web deal. in general, and I think. In general, like, yeah. uh, eventually, the internet companies just banded together and were like, all right, we're yeah, killing no IE6. IE6. IE6 we drop, even <laughs> uh, the, um, IE7 support is being dropped now. So it looks like the, the web is finally moving grown on. tired of, cool. of this stuff. Now, to get uh, back to religion, uh, is um, I, and I don't have the link in the show notes anymore. I think I copy pasted over it by accident. But Tom's Hardware did a benchmark of all the new browsers. And okay. Surpri- oh, yes. Surprise, surprise! They did this on Windows. Mm. Uh, so you have to be clear about what the test bench is. Firefox came out ahead. Mm. Oh. Firefox is faster. It, it, Chrome was a close second, and then it's the new Opera browser in third hmm. place. Um, Opera Next, they're calling it. They're switching away from their own renderer to um, WebKit. Was this Same across as, like all the various you know common tests, Java, and yeah, all that? yeah, okay. and, and a bunch of new tests. So okay. it's all benchmarks, though. It's not real world yeah. testing. And um, something we commented on in the office again is Flash. Yeah, no, yeah. No, every no. day I complain yeah. 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 something's gone wrong. And, yeah. and also, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to abuse my browser. And I don't know if they. Mm. For this, but like three windows open, two like gigs of RAM, 50 being tabs. Used. Yeah, if I, so I've racked it up to like four gigs mm. used, um, just in yeah. the browser. Jeez, it's uh, hectic. Yeah, so uh, I, if, if they do like a proper browser abuse test, I'm there, but mm. you know, just doing like a basic. JavaScript, how quickly it executes tests, doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, exactly. yeah I think the I mean, real world, the real world application of it's more useful yeah. to us. Because I've been using the latest Firefox and I've I've kicked it to the curb again. Um, okay. So I went back to Firefox for a while and then I'm like, they no, they, they did slow. this one annoying thing, which was change the DPI setting to mim- uh, mirror your desktop DPI setting. But uh, I hate that. Now everything looks too big. Oh. You know, and and it's ca- cause a little for control like, control yeah. scrolly key down. Yes, but you have to do it on every site, and uh, you know why fix it if it ain't. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm using I'm using Fire. I, I'll be honest. I have not used any other web browser but Firefox for the past mm. six years. I'm loyal for some reason. Um, I, I don't know. Just because all my bookmarks and everything are there to lose all of that now and put it in a new site is just ridiculous to me. But I I haven't encountered that problem. Like everything's always been pretty fine for me. Huh. Well, aren't you special? Uh, <laughs> my mom says so, so it must be true. <laughs> must be true. On that note, I'm moving you along. Moving along. All right. Thank you very much, Mixer. Um, too long in the browser. Living World and Guild Wars 2, a uh, mm. quick one. Mixer, I think you've actually read more about this than I have. Should I not put you on the spot? Um, no, it's all good. <laughs> but the, um, but well, I, I can handle it. I can handle it. Oh, can I you handle can it? field this one. If, uh, if all right, it must cool. Be. Well, this uh, interested me, um, so I'm just going to introduce it, and then you can <clears> take it from there. Uh, I actually own a copy of Guild Wars 2. And um, what interested me and what got me to buy Guild Wars 2 in the first place was their promise of this living world, mm. of dynamic events and, and so on. And they explained these multi-staged events. But naturally, I mean, they're software developers, right? So you don't, you don't want all the admin of manually resetting events or slightly tweaking them. You want them to be dynamic. So mm-hmm. you want them to either take inputs from the world. Um, but basically, it's multi-staged events with multiple outcomes based on the outcomes of the stages. So, for example... 
Um, if you fail in phase one, then you have some galactic failure, and like the the bridge you were meant to protect blows up, and it's unusable until the event resets, and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. So it can have a dramatic effect on the world already. If you fail in the final stages, then you might get some reward, and the bridge is not destroyed, but you don't get like the full benefit. It doesn't unlock some super secret area that you can go to to get fat loots, mm-hmm. for example. Um, so, but this adds a whole new dynamic to to that. Like I thought this living world thing was pretty yeah. impressive. It got me into yeah. it in the first place. But yeah, basically they. They've come out and said that every two weeks they're going to have a dynamic event that uh, changes the Guild Wars 2 world or landscape or whatever forever. Um, and, and it's not one of these uh, original sort of global dynamic events which gets reset and you sort of have your, you know, try at it again ad nauseum. So um, it'll be, what's cool is it'll be unique. If you, you're logged in at this time and this thing's happening, you know, you'll get a somewhat unique experience in the outcome. You'll possibly contribute towards that outcome and the result will be what the result is and that will be mm. forever written into the law of Guild Wars 2 and uh, it could be to protect a town from an invasion and whether or not that town is successfully protected means it remains on the world map or not for you know, future generations to come and explore so uh, they promise a new one of these every two weeks uh, sounds ambitious and uh, the first one is even within the next seven days they're yeah. going to have it Jeez. up so this is one of, two players, one of those cool. articles where I was like man I just wish I had more time in yeah. the day I'm <laughs> so busy with other I, I mean you want to be in there for those those cool events and uh, hopefully they come up with some really interesting stuff so I can't wait to see you know what it is they have up their sleeve they haven't really given away the details because that would be no fun if they told you what's going to yeah. happen so mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. but like we said it's not really a, an entirely new concept like mm-hmm. I mean like like we said earlier about the Matrix Online there's something very similar with the plot lines and characters and stuff like that where they had the, the live live acting actors and stuff playing as those things yeah. but the Matrix Online was a crap game so this movie yes <laughs> <laughs> alright last one for the quick geek and this one is fantastic South African students holding their own in an international supercomputing cluster challenge yay and not even holding their own but walking away with top honours well job, done guys. South Africa yeah so um, naturally uh, at my broadband we wanted to know how they did it <laughs> so um, we went prodding and, and, and uh, found out that uh, there's actually quite a lot of the information on the way, but scattered to the nine winds. Mm. And um, basically what they did was they went with an eight node cluster. They used Dell equipment. Dell sponsored them. Uh, and, you know, like happy birthday, free plug Dell. Um, <laughs> and they, um, they used a, what was popular this year, they say, is using accelerators to boost their benchmark. So they mm. had to run through a, a slew of benchmarks, which I'm not going to run through right now. Um, but what most of the other teams did, they only accelerated their Linpack. Uh, I think I think not most. Uh, the South African team was the only team to was select. The only one to accelerate uh, Nvidia. Three. Oh wow! Uh, uh, they weren't the only team to select Nvidia uh, okay. cards necessarily. Uh, I couldn't verify that. Okay. But what was interesting, yeah, is that there were basically two choices. Some folks went with like an Intel, just a general coprocessor, mm-hmm. and some folks went with GPUs. So these guys went with a K20, uh, the Nvidia K20 GPU. Um, and then they, then what you've got to do is you've got to tweak the software to be able to maximize on your hardware, right? It's mm-hmm. the exact same as developing a game, for example, except that this is like serious business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they clocked it. They, they came in with the most aggregate points. And part of the aggregate points, by the way, so um, they've got one suite of benchmarks, which is 10%. Then they have to run a bunch of applications, which is 40% of the aggregate points, uh, 50%. And then I think 40% is interviews with the yes. judges so apparently they aced that interview okay. and came out on top well, what i like about this story is that it's um well there was a big government support behind it as well which is unusual yeah. for, for south africa yeah, um, like. the csr um w- w- was a big supporter of this and what's happened was um the the i think the chief in charge there ha- happy uh sorry happy i don't remember your surname i know it's very colloquial but yeah. very friendly but uh he's uh he, I'm he, sure he's happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he saw that um, you know there, there weren't a lot of young, young and upcoming people coming through, mm. so they organised the competition at the end of last year. These mm. guys, the f- um, four of them, won that competition outright. Then they selected two more people to represent Team South Africa in Leipzig. Yeah, um, those six people then went to Dell headquarters in Austin, Texas. Another plug for Dell. Yeah, for <laughs> for some free training. Um, on the hardware, and um, then they pitched the design to mm-hmm. Dell. Dell said, cool, we think this design will do well, and that's what they implemented yep. on the day. They did not have their hardware on the first day that they arrived in Leipzig. The hardware only came the day after. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. so, they, so they were at a bit of a disadvantage compared to other teams, but they weren't the only team who didn't have their hardware uh, on the day, but yeah. uh, just also interesting to, to note that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 
something to, uh, for those who are wondering, the OS they used was CentOS. Um, and I asked them, you know, how unique is that? Uh, this is from Dell, the project manager okay. of Dell. And he said, no, actually, um, th it's not, uh, Linux is not necessarily open source Linux variants are not the only ones used there. They, people use all kinds of uh, interesting supercomputing specific um, OSs, but these guys decided to go for CentOS and okay. cream the competition. Cool. And yeah, that, the awesome thing is that this is also the first year that South Africa has sent in a team. Yeah. So the novice team came out on top. And I believe that South Africa was the only team that completed all of the tasks exactly. that were put they, they completed all their, all their app runs. Exactly. Okay. Not everybody was able to And look to at the photo. That. Look how happy they look compared to the, the superconductor girl. She was like, she was chuffed. She was like, mm, I've got a smile on my face. <laughs> they're all teeth. They're yeah. like, they, they're really happy. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's you, you show superconductor girl, guys. You show her. <laughs> all right. That brings us to the end of the Not So Quick Geek. And <laughs> we're going to talk about some other stuff now. So let's talk some events. Mm. For um, We're going to just run. This is going to be like a serious plug for my broadband and my gaming. Uh, I apologize to everybody who's not from my broadband and my <laughs> gaming uh, who might have uh, a chip on their shoulder about it. But um, You have no idea who we are. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you feel that we've, there's been a gross oversight of something cool, um, stardates.ca.za, and you can contact us. Um, anything or just add my event you noob at let's talk network dot tv should get to us mm -hmm. um, and uh, with that my gaming is running a dota tournaments yeah every sunday until the 21st of july yes, yes? Uh, i think uh, this coming sunday is the third week of the competition but it's cool you can enter um any week really and uh you know it's it's a points based system whether or not you'll get into the final but um, even if you only enter in the third week, let's say, you can still upset the balance for the, the teams that have been there from week one and two. So, and it's just a good place for South African Dota players to come test their medal. We've got really some of the, the top clans in South Africa competing, as well as a bunch of newcomers. And, Is this Dota 1 or Dota 2? Uh, Dota 2, yeah. Okay, cool. And, Dota 2, um, I'm going to make a note of that. Yeah. And how do you enter? Uh, you simply head on over to the My Gaming Forum, and uh, we have a specific section of the forum, uh, very uh, easily titled you know, My Gaming Dota 2 Tournament or whatever, so you can find it. And uh, you just go there and register with your team. Or if you're a lone wolf and you're looking for a team, uh, there's also a section there where you can try and find some players to join up with. And yeah, we're having a lot of fun. Really NFG! Cool. And, yeah. if, and if you are like me and hate multiplayer games, I'm sorry. Then, <laughs> then you can play on your iPad in the corner and cry. <laughs> yeah, you can cry. Play your social social games. Thank you for me. Tap, tap on your cubes. With <laughs> yeah, curiosity. exactly. No, no, that's over now. That's over now. <laughs> All right. We've also got the My Broadband, coming, uh, My Broadband Conference coming up mm -hmm. later in the year, 9th of October. Registrations are open. MyBB2013.co.za. You can check the speaker lineup. Uh, the schedule as it's been confirmed right now. Um, and yeah, just register. It's a Gallagher estate this year, not the not, mm. uh, scaling up. It's yeah, be good. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we, we, to put it simply, we ran out of space. Yeah, which yep. is great. So, yeah. Which is which is always good. Well, it's great, but it's also hard <laughs> finding a place to <laughs> mm. to host an event. Uh, it, it's surprisingly hard to find an affordable place to host an event in this country. Anyway, that said, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this next segment of the show is something I like to call "What Geekery Is This." So let's start off with the big gaming news, since we have you in the show, James, that mm. Microsoft and the Xbox One. What on earth happened there? Yeah, I mean, during the hiatus, all hell broke loose at E3. Um, you know, Microsoft came out and announced their um, DRM policy around the Xbox One, which was going to require always on internet, logging in once every 24 hours, um, you know, all sorts of fancy, you know, you can only allow 10 people to share your account and all these grand, grand ideas. But... While it had some merits in some areas, the DRM thing and the 24-hour login thing was not among those meritous elements. Um, <laughs> I think when, when people like wait out the pros and very cons, well, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, the, the icing on top was that Sony came out uh, following <laughs> Microsoft and said, well, all that horrible stuff Microsoft just said, we're doing the opposite. And essentially, they maintain the status quo. They're, they're, you can have secondhand games. Uh, on the PlayStation 4, you, you know, you're not restricted to lending out your discs or reselling the discs secondhand. Um, and just about the worst thing that Sony did was say that they have to, uh, that you now have to pay for multiplayer access by getting PlayStation yeah. Plus. But it's somewhat mitigated by the fact that you get free games on PlayStation Plus every month. So, you know... They're still ahead of Microsoft in that uh, yeah. So, yeah. So in every regard, they sort of trumped Microsoft and made them look like fools at but, E3. But here's and the Microsoft thing. did a good job of making themselves look like fools. Yeah, as well. the, the, that's the thing, is that... Um, 
like the the whole reaction to Sony going, oh, you don't have to, we don't have the DRM, you can share your games. It shouldn't elicit that sort of reaction where everyone goes, yeah, it's amazing because that's the norm. That yeah, should because be the surely, standard. surely, yeah. like the whole the whole concept of game ownership, you know. Mm. Like that—that that should be a given. I mean, people were giving standing ovations to Jack Tretton. I mean, you know, come on, man. That's like the, the least you can do. It's like you just bought a car and they gave you the tires along with it. <laughs> yeah. Yay! It's like, well, thank you so much. You're doing us a um, huge favor. Um, and, and we'll get to why that is, I think. But just to obviously uh, continue the story, about a week or so later, Microsoft had taken so much punishment apparently from the internet. Nah. You know how the internet nah. gets when when they get on top of something and. They did a complete what has become known as the Xbox 180 on oh, their DRM policies. Yeah. 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 But that said, um, I don't think it's just the internet. Because no, no. internet, we know, we know for a fact internet petitions don't work. <laughs> they felt it in the wallet, which yes. is where it stung the most. Pre-orders. Pl- pl- yeah, the PlayStation 3, despite going on sale later, got four. more pre-orders. Yeah. PlayStation 4, yeah. my bad. PlayStation 4, um, yeah. Got more pre-orders than the Xbox yeah. One, and uh, I think they may have bit. seen some pre-order cancellations and, and stuff like that because they, they get all these uh, metrics from the various retailers. Yeah, and um, and that, that's the only way you can actually speak to these companies is to hit them in the wallet. So Microsoft was, I think, a bit stunned by the humble pie they had to eat and reverse their DRM policies. And everything's pretty much in line with your experience on the Xbox 360 now. So you can sell your games, you can lend them to your friends. There's no um, uh, always on internet requirements apart from a one-time setup and a one-time mm. activation of your game, I think. And that's that's just to, I think, download I think some, some sort of patch or something for the system? <sighs> yeah, they say. some sort of day one But But it, look, the whatever. story also has a flip side to it because um, as a lot of people read after the fact, um, this does change a lot of of the more progressive things Microsoft had in mind yeah. for, for the system. Now, I've, I've read some, some interesting commentary on this yes. <clears throat> with some folks saying that, uh, well, uh, Gorka obviously took the very contrarian stance that um, we've ruined the Xbox One and, um, and it, you know, or, or the Xbox One is ruined and it's all our fault because we, mm. we demanded all this... Uh, yeah, all this stuff. I, I, and, I mean, and then there's people who disagree, and I fall and, in the camp of disagreeing. Yeah, and uh, and then there are folks who are saying, oh, but Microsoft should have had the happy middle ground. And mm. um, also something we've discussed in the office quite a bit. Mm. I'm not entirely sure that was possible. Um, and and people might think that it's a trivial thing for Microsoft to just allow you to link disks to your account and let you play without the disks, mm. um, and then allow you to loan out your disks. To people, I mean, obviously, if it's still unlinked, yeah, uh, and then lo- loan out your discs to people to be able to, uh, you know, just share the games offline mm. and and so on, and without having the offline check, you just have a once-off offline check, all that stuff, and and the the thing is, the the system that's been in play like this for the longest time, and even they do not offer game rentals, is Steam. Mm. Yeah, um, they just, I, I mean, rumor has it they're working on game rentals, but uh, more like loaning to your friend. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. sorry, not rentals, yeah. but yeah, loaning your, sharing, yeah, your sharing, game, sharing the game yeah. with your friend. And and Microsoft had all this planned, but it was it, it hinged on the fact that your console was going to be connected to the internet the whole yeah. time. And um, while I understand that people are upset, there wasn't a happy middle ground to be had. I don't think it's as easy as all that yeah. to have built that happy middle ground as people are trying to make it out to be. Also, like the fact of the matter is, is that whatever Microsoft had planned for the console and was, oh, we've got these uh, lower prices, whatever, it, down the line, that's irrelevant because then they didn't even push that idea. They didn't even in their their PR speak, and that's essentially where this mess came from. Is they they. Very They're poor very handling poor. <laughs> of marketing and PR. They, there was no clarity surrounding the system. There was this big upheaval about it. Uh, the internet was fighting back at it, even though it had probably no effect on it because, I mean, it's the internet. <laughs> like, like, like the Let's Talk Geek, Geek page, and we will cure cancer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but and then not a true story. No, not a true story. <laughs> not at all. Um, but then the, where the real change came from, I'm I'm putting my bets on Sony because that that's their competition. They saw that Sony went was completely the against hero. them, it's was the hero, yeah. and they couldn't stand yeah. that, so they had to fall back on their sword. Might be. Basically, <laughs> I'm going to move us along. Um, hmm. the, the there was an emergency no DRM oh, yes, special uh, on yeah, just, one. I mean, uh, if, if we need to move along, um, just one of the you know the counterpoints to this whole thing was uh, by Jim uh, Sterling over on The Escapist, who did a very uh, and amusing... And Destructoid. And Destructoid, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and um, he did a very amusing uh, Jimquisition episode uh, shortly after the DRM 180. And uh, he spoke about why the 
uh, why Xbox and Sony uh, with their PlayStation 4 don't actually get to make these sort of demands on mm. us with um, mm. DRM and what have you. And it boils down to uh, with, when these are closed systems, just about the only thing that the consoles have going for them is their ease of use and the ability to, you know, the only control the consumer has at that point is the ability to share his Having games a game, yeah. or resell his games. That's the only sort of purchase market power that the consumer has in that regard because you're kind of locked into those systems. And to compare... You know, to say, oh, you know, PC's got DRM and they've been having it for years, so, you know, why is it such a shock in Xbox is not a good argument, in his opinion, because we have uh, choice in our market. We have Steam, we have good old games, we have Gamers Gate, we have Green Man The Gaming, Humble Store, we have the which Humble is like Store. a, a we have, sleeper. We have a range of awesome indie games constantly. I mean, there's too many, we often joke about how we've got so many games we can't even play them all. Yeah, it's like become um, a stock PC <clears throat> gamer joke, and it's not yeah. actually funny. I mean, you yeah. drop the whole because, bunch of money in games, you because, get you know, Yeah, because, and these indie guys can get their games out there on the internet they don't have to go through some restrictive publisher policies with Sony or Microsoft to get their games on some sort of indie marketplace if they deign it worthy um, you know so we have flexibility and options and choice and uh, it's a different environment altogether so you can't compare the two which was his point and anyway go watch this video it's very amusing and uh, I think he makes some good points at the same time flexibility, flexibility options, options choice things that consoles don't have things that consumers want yes well, apparently. <clears throat> Not Apple consumers, obviously. No, but Says I, the Mac user. Yeah, yes. then. But you're a different breed. So. <laughs> um, the, uh, while we're on the topic, uh, Uplay was hacked. I got mm. this email last night. Um, hey, by the way, it looked very suspicious. I didn't know whether I should click yeah, on this thing. Yeah, guys are saying it almost looked like spam. Yeah, but, it looked uh, like, a, like a phishing attempt. I think it was very hastily sl uh, slammed out by Ubisoft. But... I ended it up sort just of ties using in with our DRM discussion anyway. here because it is a form of DRM. You play, uh, you have to have the you play account and register your game with you play before you can play it and log in every time or go into offline mode. And it, it becomes a great hindrance to PC gamers <coughs> to uh, <laughs> you know uh, play their games using you play. And I, I've not had the best experience with it. It's sort of stable and sort of works. And now they've gone and gotten hacked and leaked my email, my password, and my something else. Well, hopefully it's not your plain text password. My, hopefully it's a hashed username. password. <clears throat> um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, they didn't release details on exactly what form this information was leaked, but they just said, oh, it all got stolen. You guys better go change your passwords and better change any passwords that were the same on another service. Which I don't even same remember. Combination. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's just really annoying when they force you into these DRM schemes and then they don't even have the decency to protect it properly and they allow it to get hacked and stuff like that. Every time I hear DRM nowadays, I just like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to okay. move us swiftly along from that <clears throat> and, uh, and talk about something that I saw in Business Tech the other day, Quentin. Um, like, of course. Top five tech flops. Well, it's funny that the, the top five tech, flop, tech flops actually came from uh, something else that happened in the industry, which was... Uh, BlackBerry came out with its results. Now, and I'm not going to bore you with the finances, but the results were not good, to say the least. Um, they basically, the BlackBerry 10 uh, software OS and devices that they've been touting as like the next big thing and like, you know, this is the big push. And, the, and they've been talking it, it up. Has, they've been saying yeah, it's yeah, been for sure. selling surprisingly I mean, well. They took it on a road show and they, they've really been selling this thing. And the results came in. Analysts were pegging the BlackBerry 10 device sales at around 3.6 million, 3.7 million, somewhere around there. And they only managed to sell 2.9. Mm, somewhere around there, two point seven, I think. Under three million. Yeah, basically. so it was under just under uh, a million devices. They, they missed their target by nine hundred million devices, and basically nine hundred million, nine hundred thousand. Oh, sorry, nine hundred thousand. Okay. Sure, imagine nine hundred million, <laughs> nine hundred thousand devices, and so analysts and investors were all, oh well, it's a flop. <laughs> and so we just asked the question, is it too soon to call it a flop? Yes or no? So we basically took a look back at some other tech flops that happened, you know. So more of the, the, the more notorious ones. And uh, they're, they're actually quite interesting because uh, BlackBerry, it's not the first time BlackBerry's had to deal with a, a flop device. The, the BlackBerry Playbook springs to mind. As being, and the Storm, what's that first full-touch device of theirs? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was moly, that com thing was completely terrible. sluggish. That, that, that thing couldn't do anything. Um, so, so the BlackBerry Playbook was one of the devices that we, we saw flopped like terribly but you know blackberry is not the only big company that's had to suffer these things google suffered something uh, something of a flop even before the product launched and that was the the nexus q um i don't know if you know like the Nexus q the media streaming device that was linked to See, only I, the google i don't even know that i think that speaks to yeah no no uh, well look it was it was so. never it was never really tested outside of the u.s 
it won't work because all their content is, is only available in the US. Yeah. But it was linked to the Google Play Store, so you were basically buying a $300 YouTube streamer, which uh, I'm sure you, there's an app for that now that does it for free. <laughs> but, um, well, it's, not, it's not quite that rough. It, they, they do have other content available in the yeah, Play Store, for sure. but not outside the US, and you can't hack it like you can mm. the uh, uh, Apple uh, content store. Yeah. Like, uh, Apple, you can just lie to and tell them, I am in the US, and they go, okay, you're in the US, and then they let you buy content. Yeah. So, so Google then postponed the launch of that, and then eventually they just sort of disappeared. And like, yeah. We really spoke about it. <laughs> but then, of course, then Microsoft had the, the Zune, which, uh, look, that was... See, the, the, this is a contrast between That's the things. That's actually a joke in Big Bang Theory. Oh, That's it? how bad it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this, this was the contrast between... That's how bad between... Big Bang Theory is? <laughs> 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 the, this is why it's difficult to put a timeline to how long you need to measure a, a flop because the Google Nexus Q basically flopped before it was even launched while the Zune, well, it lasted a good number, what, three years? Mm. 2006, 2009? Microsoft really flogged it to try and keep it alive. I mean, even when the devices, they stopped manufacturing the devices, they, they put the software onto different platforms and you know, another software sort of sort of died out. So, so yeah, is, is BlackBerry 10 a, a flop or not? I suppose um, time will tell. Uh, See the CEO of BlackBerry. He's like, oh well, we're only five months into the whole the whole thing, so it's he believes it's too soon to tell. But I mean, look, if you're an invest, investor and you're putting millions of dollars into something, you sort of want to see results. Mm -hmm. And you, when you're playing against the big boys like Apple and Samsung, you, you, there's like very small margin for failure here. Yeah. What were the other flops? The, uh, the other one I see in the in the thing is the Nokia N-Gage. Yeah, oh, that thing was hilarious. Uh, oh, gosh, so yes. there's some comments in the IRC the, from this that I think is actually quite cool. Garan is in there commenting about mm. it. He said he liked it. And I know Gareth, uh, my brother, who's who's been a host on, on uh, Let's Talk Geek before he immigrated to Cape Town. <laughs> and, um, and he loved his N-Gage as well. It, mm. Basically, what the N-Gage was was a gaming phone. Mm. It was, a, it was a, like a... A cell phone with a D-pad, and then you could use your numeric yeah. keypad and as for, uh, for, buttons. For most buttons. intents and purposes, it was a decent idea, except for the the way that the speaker and microphone were placed the whole, on the side. But how else are you going to do it? With well, the, the on the whole, back, maybe, <laughs> so you didn't have to hold it like a weird banana-shaped thing to your head. Like this. Like, I think, I think. Look, if people whether they enjoyed it or not is irrelevant. Um, when the engage went on sale, I mean, this 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 device was put there to compete with Nintendo. Basically, that's mm. who they wanted to go after. The handheld gaming market and they were being outsold outsold 100 to 1 like in the the week it launched uh, i mean they didn't do too well i think um by the time the engage qd which was the the, the run-up to it i think by the the end of its lifespan the only sale sold two million uh engages and all and plus from from the disaster that was the engage was born the side talking which uh, i'll demonstrate now using my iphone Oh, this is not how you speak on a phone. This is the, this this makes no sense. No sense. It's almost as ridiculous as using a phablet or a tablone, a tablone mm. to to speak. Where you're like, oh, you know, what's what's going on over here? Yeah. It's just some things just. I, don't I do work. believe we have an awesome gift. I, I have an I have a of that. Topic. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I was away from my mic. I have a 6.3 inch phone here that I can. Oh, there you go. See, now we can we can demonstrate the, ridiculous the ridiculousness of, of. Okay, which one looks better? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> that still looks sort of acceptable, but I mean, this this is just not. It's just not. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it just looks. It's, the guys right, in uh, the guys in uh, IRC are saying, "Will the Wii be a flop?" Yeah, oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. and and so, uh, some guy also. Chi uh, sorry, was Garan again chiming mm. in and and saying that that he thinks it was a flop before it got before started. It even got started. Yeah, and. I'm not entirely sure of that. If you go and uh, look, uh, while the, the gaming press is part of the gaming press's job uh, is to you know talk nice, mm. say nice things about games before they come out, so that uh, I mean, like, because that's what we as gamers are interested in reading, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear about how crap people think the Ouya is before well, it's even launched, because that's not fair commentary yet. Yes, and yeah. we've actually used the thing. Yeah. So, yeah. But if um, the, Pen <laughs> the Penny Arcade report, um, uh, Ben Kuchera there did a roundup, and they're I mean, while it's not aimed at the core gaming market, the fact is there are some exclusives on the Ouya. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, yeah, uh, I'm going to call them exclusives. Ouya, Ouya, Ouya. I don't even know how Ouya. to pronounce it. Um, I'm, I'm not Ouya. actually sure what the yeah. correct pronunciation um, is. Yeah. The, that the weird actually one. looked pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, it's just, I mean, I know it doesn't, can't get on it doesn't really appeal device. to um, you know, the hardcore gamer yeah. types But on, what's amazing gaming, about it, so. I mean, the, the, it, the controller is bigger than the actual console. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very compact console. And I console. think that console could be smaller, but they had to you know, make it look cute and like a, a cute design. Because it's it really just a, a cell phone system on chip. So, yeah. 
you know, it could have been really tiny if they wanted to. Speaking speaking of cell phones, there was also another phone that bombed pretty badly, and that is the HTC First. Oh yeah, the Facebook phone. The Facebook phone. And um, while while we're busy being prophetic. Firefox, Mozilla has just launched the phone as well. Oh, yes, um, of phones. course. Uh, they, they didn't just pick a single device. Uh, they launched an OS, Entry Firefox OS, yeah. And they have launched on an Alcatel, of all mm. things, and ZTE devices. So these are budget entry-level phones. Um, Alcatel still exists? Yeah, and I saw them while I was at CES, and I'm going, Alcatel. Who would have known? Who My would have very, known? very first phone was an Alcatel, and they are making a play for, for the open phone market. Android okay. and Firefox OS. Cool. Um, wow, okay. Yeah, and so that's cool. Yeah, they're aiming at the entry level. Now, when you look at the specs of these devices, entry level doesn't even begin to describe it. Maybe what maybe to put this in perspective without running uh, over the specs and boring you to tears, the price of the ZTE Open, the Firefox OS phone, is 60 euro odd, right? Well, okay. Cash. Mm -hmm. That includes 30 euro credit on prepaid. So the phone costs 300 rand, hmm. basically. So they 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 like oh, they sort and, of paying in uh, in the Nokia Asha yeah, yeah. In that market, but, a half but, decent smartphone. But smartphone, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and the, not the, a feature phone. The, the Nokia yeah. guys will uh, lynch me if they ever find out I called the Nokia Ushers not, not smartphones. Nokia loves to have the Nokia Usher mm. considered a smartphone, but I don't think it has the ecosystem mm. for it. Mm. Yeah. Um, neither does Firefox always yet, but it's got the beginnings of an ecosystem for it. They've got a store, a mar you know, like a marketplace. They've got you know, some interesting ideas of what to do, whereas the, the Usher is very much more a conventional type of phone. And one more gadget to just add to the prophetic um, things that might flop. Flop list is the Nvidia Shield. I'd say let's keep an eye on that thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll give it some time yeah. before we like start. Yeah, yeah. All right. Mean. So I, I know we're running a bit long, but we have been on hiatus for a while. And for those of you um, uh, that stick around until after the show, we'll give you a little bit of a rundown about what we've been doing. Let that be an incentive to you watching this or listening <laughs> to this afterwards to tune in live. Uh, James will show you his navel. Yeah. If sorry, you're lucky. sorry, toxic money <laughs> that you weren't able to catch the last the the, the live show <laughs> in advance for not being able to participate. Um, so what's happening with broadband in South Africa? Now we all sit in my broadband offices every day. And we'll so, tell you a thing or two. <laughs> yeah, we can t we can tell you a thing or two. Now, obviously, there are far more connected guys mm. out there uh, who are in the industry and stuff. Um, but uh, the fact is, we, we we're pretty close to the to the, the pulse of things. And um, and so here's here's what's cooking. All right. So the rumors that Neotel is uh, people are looking to buy Neotel are. are more furious than ever. Mm, uh, mm. I was looking for a better word. Heated up. Yeah. Resurgent. Yeah. So um, simmering. We, we, carried the, we carried the story and got quite a bit of attention for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a shameless plug. Um, and, <laughs> um, but the reason that's relevant is because now, that, that was like a couple of weeks ago, and it's come up again mm. in the Sunday papers. So uh, it, uh, it, it's, this is looking like a, like a thing. And I saw Hilton Tarrant uh, wrote a column today in which he argued that Counterintuitively, somebody like Vodacom or MTN picking up Neotel would actually boost competition in the country. And the reason for that, and I tend to agree with this on a high level, is because then they'd be able to take on Telcom more readily. Mm. Telcom still has by far the biggest fiber network in the country, and it's going to take a, like, something significant mm -hmm. to unseat mm -hmm. them. But and that the fact means is, this will Telcom make them real contenders. Getting a physical broadband connection into your home with some sort of fiber to the home solution uh, um, and and just g getting you like decent <laughs> fiber back all but that is not the big thing i mean the fiber network is one thing the big thing is neotel sits on some prime lte spectrum that's that's, that's, too, that's yeah. what that they want gold that, that is, is the gold platinum, mine that is tanzanite that is <laughs> that is coming tonight <laughs> unobtainium unobtainium especially in this country yeah mm. so talking about that perhaps just a a, a quick uh, recap of what's happened on the spectrum front yeah mm. What, what, you want us to chime in? No. Okay. <laughs> that was it. That was oh, that what was happened. It. That was it. Okay. Just so we know what's going on. Yeah. Um, Telcom has hiked prices on some of its products. DSL stays largely the same, but line rental goes yeah. up. Yeah. Just yeah. a little. Yeah. But still, it's up. Telcom has settled on uh, the Competition Commission complaint that was laid before it for abuses during 2005 to 2007. And then to 2009 as well. Yeah. And mm. so the, the settlement apparently includes uh, cutting... Uh, prices, especially across their wholesale stuff, paying a 200 million rand fine 
penalty, which is significantly reduced from what it was. Uh, it, it could have been saw. And, and the Competition Commission was asking the tribunal to find them billions. It was three uh, billion. I, yeah, I, I've lost the amount. Then she wants it's, three it's billion. It's an amount of money I cannot comprehend. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's the situation with Telcom. We're still waiting on when exactly uh, these things will be implemented. But rumors surfaced recently that an IPC ADSL, that's the wholesale ADSL, Service will be cut, but not by enough to make much of a difference, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe to give the ISPs a bit of more breathing room because these guys have been operating on very thin margins and really squeezing what they can out of the network. Yeah. So, you know, all the, if, when we're ever complaining about congestion or uh, shaping or throttling or whatever, it's because they're really working on that ragged edge of maintaining an operating network and still making money. Uh, so. A favorite, a favorite and, joke I've heard is that the uh, South African ISPs have really found a way to build a business model out of selling things at a loss. Yeah. Um, but I mean, so. look, th- it makes sense in terms of what the Competition Commission wanted from Telcom was to make things more competitive. So giving the I- ISPs like, like you know, some breathing room make, that falls in, in with that. Yeah. Though, can someone explain to me what Telcom's logic is uh, regarding the increasing line rental prices? Uh, aren't, they, aren't they like losing fixed line subscribers yes and, and it's and it's interesting but they also <laughs> assert that they uh, have a deficit mm-hmm. on on providing fixed line services okay. so um in other words they cross subsidize the cost of actually running that copper cable and maintaining that copper cable with usage and with the adsl products and stuff so the, um that's why llu has been held up mm-hmm. uh, yeah, is okay. because they were trying to resolve this ald thing and ICASA has now said, okay, they've heard telecoms. That's the other thing that's happened. Um, ICASA has set some very aggressive deadlines for itself, among them for local loop unbundling, also among them uh, the spectrum situation. So the, the silence I had earlier wasn't entirely fair. <laughs> but, um, it remains to be seen because these deadlines are aggressive. Um, and so what they're doing in LLU is they say they're just going to follow the letter of the regulations okay. of the facilities leasing regulations. All right, so interesting. We'll see what mm-hmm. happens with yeah. LLU. Um, and then one last thing I think that's worth mentioning is internet solutions have launched an SME thing. So, uh, if you're a business or a reseller, this is for you, uh, not that interesting to consumers, but perhaps, I'm interested. Inter- perhaps interesting yeah, to consumers, um, is it's a self-provisioning portal. So you as a business, uh, can go and, uh, get a service, get it online. No, and they say no need to talk on it to, to a call center operator, anything like that. We hate talking to be real people. Exactly. <laughs> Especially if you're a techie, right? So you just provision it all online. Mm. Now, an interesting thing Internet Solutions demoed to us last year is the ability to switch line speed on the fly. Mm. I want that stuff. Mm. I want that stuff to make my line faster or slower on the fly because that's awesome. Yeah. Um, also a way to control your spend if you don't need if you don't need yeah. 40 megabits per second. Then you can downgrade yourself time, to 10 yeah. and pay that price for a while. Anyway, that's a cool yeah. idea. Cool. Yeah. All right. So with that, let's get back into some uh, less newsy geekery. Board games. Yeah, yeah. I love board games. Uh, did you like, like why did you kill yourself? Okay, we're skipping board games. We're not skipping board games. We'll be really quick. <laughs> All right, so... There's, the magic of editing will <clears throat> solve well, yeah, everything. Some movie magic. Board games! <laughs> um, that's, how we, that's how we like to <laughs> yeah, roll. No, let, me, let me do that a bit better. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so uh, moving away from just the newsy stuff, let's talk about something like completely tangential, something alternative even. Board games. So mm. these three of the four people in the show today are semi-avid board gamers. Um, though Annie has joined us for the occasional board game and enjoyed it. You just need a board game with the right people, i.e. not, um, not some of the people who are present in IRC at the moment. <laughs> oh, <laughs> IRC <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's all right. You can have some anthrax in the mail for you tomorrow. I think it's, I think it's also about the, the game that you're playing because some of them are just so complicated. No, no, and see, long and boring. All right, so, but let, let's run through this. Um, Quinton, what have you played recently that you think has been really cool? Okay, well, the, 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 best, the best thing that happened to me was Spartacus. It's obviously it's a board game based on the show, but it's it's just completely it's mind blowingly amazing. It, and you would probably think it's very complicated, but you don't you don't read rules for these things. You just you learn as you play. Well, as long as someone who knows what they're Somebody speaking has about. A little bit next to yeah, them. basically it's uh, a management game and a fighting game, and it's not a video game. This is actually board figurines and everything. Um, it's conniving. You can collect gold coins. You can basically trade anything and you can pay other people to throw fights you can pay them to quit the game you know you can let you pay them to do anything it's it's you make make the game almost make the rules yeah well there are there are there are rules but yeah, yeah. yeah you you can stretch it out and and 
do cool things. Um, but what's, what's so amazing about it is it really is. It's like two games in one. I um, mean, with the different phases and the different play. But like I say, it's, it's one of those games that when you're busy playing it with somebody who knows how to play it, obviously, you can pick it up so quickly and it's tons of fun. You get to screw your friends over, which is basically why we, why we play these things, right? Uh, uh, a merry, a, that's what we like to call in, in my circle of friends a merry trash games. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, so what that, that's about is uh, European games are often very less aggressive. So there are ways to sort of uh, snooker your opponents, but it's not like I attack you and I steal your thing. And Those so, games aren't fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, yeah. no I'm kidding. Uh, but there's a sort of subtle interplay uh, yeah. in the mechanics. So rather than outright attacking uh, other people. Um, and so the game I really enjoy is Navigador. Um, and what that's about, it's about the, the age of uh, co- uh, Portuguese colonization. And uh, that also takes you through also a multifaceted game. Um, and you, you know, there's, a, there's a market that you get to play in. And what makes this game so interesting and so also easy to pick up and play is while there are uh, probably, I think, six different phases or six, six different actions you can take, they limit the search space uh, in, gaming, uh, uh, in game theory terms that you you can only think sort of three steps ahead so they put the they put the phases on a on a circle and you can only move to a phase that's three ahead of you unless you take a penalty. You have to kill a worker or kill a ship. So you can build workers and ships, right? That's one of the things the game lets this you do. This is a perfect example. When somebody explains how to play a game to you, it sounds very complicated. Yeah. But, but, but <laughs> what I'm saying is... You learn by playing. Exactly. exactly. You learn it by playing. What, what yeah. makes it so easy to learn by playing is that you don't have to think more than, more than three, three... You don't have to think about more than three phases. You think about the next three phases that you can yeah. take, and that's it. So you don't have to think about... Everything that you can possibly do, you which is those three. unlike Chaos, which you've obviously played. Yeah, like we, we've played Chaos, uh, Chaos I, in the so old I, world. I don't even know what's going on. I'd yeah. have to relearn that game, but it was very quick and easy to pick up at the time. So yeah, but the, the, you do get into them very easily, and and for the whole weekend, I think we we had great games. And then if you ask me how Chaos works, you well, be, like, be able to no, tell you. But, yeah. It's one of those yeah. games where you like. You say you need to, you get to think three phases ahead. This there are some people who play this game who are thinking towards the end game. I'm already thinking about yeah. the next game. Yeah, <laughs> oh, so, I'm so that good. This, yeah. like deeper than chess. Yeah. So <laughs> a little bit, for those a little of bit, you yeah. who uh, the last game you played was Cluedo or Monopoly or Scrabble, there's actually and you can check these guys out. Board Game Geek. Mm. There's a wealth of games out there and stuff coming from Germany and and uh, especially Germany but other European countries as well. Mm. That's really really interesting. There's uh, a there's a fire fly board game coming out and there's also mm-hmm. games that operate a lot like role playing games Dungeons and Dragons type games um, that work almost exactly the same but uh, like you were explaining it to oh, me oh yeah James, well that was, that's day. a very old game I, it's, I think it's out of print now yeah. but um, you know back when I was in primary school we used to play Warhammer Quest and it was a sort of build your own dungeon uh, affair and you had little figurines and you had cards that you draw from a deck that would give you events so ooh giant spiders fight the giant spiders roll some dice see who wins put on, yeah. your, put on your wizard robe and hat if, uh, you want exactly. to, if you want to play a game that, that involves wizardry and you try to plan but you know you just can't um, you should play the Terry Pratchett oh, Discworld. 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 The Discworld, Discworld board game oh my word that, that game is, is ma- it's like the Mad Magazine game on steroids <laughs> that thing is fantastic <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, with that, uh, we mm. hope you enjoyed our short introduction to alternative board gaming. It's great fun. And we always end the show on what we like to call a kicker. Annie, you selected the show's kicker. Would you like me to read your beautiful prose that you've written <laughs> in the show notes for it? <laughs> it's Chris Hatfield, um, who recently came back home from the International Space Station. He's a Canadian mm. astronaut. I think it's high in space. Yeah. You're not reading the beautiful prose. Oh, my bad. <clears throat> Do you want me to read the beautiful prose? Yes. All right. So... Chances are, unless you've been living under a rock, you've watched or heard Chris Hadfield's Space Oddity music video. It is the first music video recorded in space about aboard the International Space Station. Um, he did David Bowie's Space Oddity with his own spin, and it earned a stamp of approval from the original artist himself. He sings the lyrics, and the piano was recorded on Earth, and he plays the guitar in space. And uh, he just recently returned to Earth um, after a five-month stint aboard the ISS, during which he became the first Canadian commander of the station. And his tweets, photos, videos, and live webcasts caused quite a spike in global interest in space science and the International Space Station. Um, This is a guy who did AMAs on Reddit. He co-designed the new Canadian $5 note, which is based on astronauts and and space robots. Jeez. 
He performed experiments that school kids put to him from around the world, like what happens if you wring out a wet washcloth in space? <laughs> and, uh, you know, awesome stuff like that. And he regular tre- regularly tweeted some of the most incredible images I have ever seen from space. So he recently reti- re- announced his retirement, which is very sad. But this is an incredible video that he did as a goodbye to the space station because the lyrics of the mm. song go, you know, I'm coming home. And uh, and that was literally the last thing he did before mm. he left I, I must the say, station. I felt all the feels, even even had a bit of we a don't, We don't say that in real life. <laughs> you say that for Tumblr, man. <laughs> all the Very feels. Cool. Yeah, it, nobody said lol until people started saying lol. <laughs> now it's a thing. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> With that, thank you so much for joining us for our show. Uh, gentlemen, where can people find you? Let's start there. James. I think the best place to come find me is just on mygaming.c.za and I'm you know, on the forum all the time. The all-seeing eye, they've started to call me. I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, come to my gaming. We've got news and we've got people to chat to on the forum. It's great. Cool. Quinton. <laughs> well, you can mostly find me on Twitter. <laughs> uh, you might... Twitter handle name is at Cornea with a Q, Q O R N E A. Feel free to follow me in real life as well. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you can check uh, out businesstech.co.today. That's where we get all the business technology news. Cool bananas. Annie, where can people find you? Right here on letstalkgeek.net. Woo! Do we clap? <laughs> I'm clapping. <laughs> I'm Jan Vermeulen. You can find me at mybroadband.co.za or on Twitter at JanVZA. You can also follow, subscribe, like Let's Talk Geek at Let's Talk Geek. Search LT Star Network on YouTube if you want to follow the videos there. We have, uh, we've revamped our websites. So it, it, it needs a bit of design work, but which South African website doesn't? LTG. <laughs> ltnet.tv or ltg.letstalknetwork.tv and that'll take you to our new blog we post stuff there the RSS feed from there triggers our podcasts and stuff so if you want to download a podcast you can take your favorite reader and subscribe to that and with that join us same time same place next week we'll see you then they killed my wiki they killed my wiki they kill you what? what?